then shall we say that Abraham, uh, our father, has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified or made right with God, just as if he had never sinned, if he was justified by works, he would have something to boast about, but not before God. Can I just say this to you? Religion always wants to boast about how good we are. And most places, unfortunately, uh, religions outside of Christianity, Muslim and other areas, uh, other faiths, are always trying to do things to please God. The Muslim uh, trying to work their way. Uh, the Buddhist tries to chant his way. Uh, but in Christianity, unfortunately, sometimes people try to take works and mix them together with faith. And you cannot mix the two. We stand righteous before God by faith alone because man always wants to justify himself by what he did. There is a part of us that wants to come before God and say, God, I prayed enough, I gave enough, I did enough, and Lord, now I stand before you because I've done all of these things, and I thank you that your blessings rest upon me. I want you to know God never looks at it like that in, in that sort of a way. So sometimes what we do is we find ourselves in church. It's always an attempt to go to people, work more, give more, do more, in, a, in an attempt to say, if you do these things, that you'll be blessed. But here the writer, Paul, goes and he says, I want you to look at Abraham. And that Abraham was made righteous apart from his works. Completely apart from his works. Now, for some of you, you go, yeah, I got this, Pastor John. I've heard this before. But every one of us need to get this deep into our hearts. That it is not what we do that pleases God. By works, no man can stand before God and say, I did it. Every one of us are guilty, and the only way that you come to God is by faith. Faith and faith alone. And you'll see how the scripture says. He says, uh, he says that you would have somewhere to boast, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, wages are not counted as grace, but as a debt. So if you attempt to be made right with God by what you do, I witnessed enough, I worked with VBS, I went on the outreach, whatever it may be, and you say, yeah, in some way God now looks at me and because of the things that I do, he looks at me in a different way and he thinks that I'm good because of the things that I, that I do. Listen, if, if we approach God that way, he's saying now that's no longer grace. But that's a debt. God, I did this. Now you should give me your blessing. I, you, you may sit here and say, well, Pastor John, we all know that. I'm here to say to you, listen to the radio. Watch the TV. Most pastors, most churches are always putting stipulations back on to how you can get God's blessings by the things that you do. If you pay your tithes, then God's blessings will come upon you. If you pray over your kids, then the blessings of God will be upon you. And it's always a requirement. If I do something, then God will bless me back. That is old covenant law. And Paul is taking his big sledgehammer in the Holy Ghost here. And he is saying, that is not true. If it is by works, then God owes you a debt. And how many of you know that God doesn't owe us a debt? How many of you know that it's us who owes him the debt? He doesn't owe us a debt. So it's not, now I do it so you'll repay me. And he's going to make this incredibly clear. Verse 5. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. So now listen to this. We're, we're going to get to James. So anybody that's here that's going, oh, but James says, you know, you know, show me your faith without your works. I'll show you by faith, by works. We'll get there in a minute. But listen, you have to take this on its merit. This is the word of God and it stands alone. So we will go to the other passage and some people, I've actually heard people say, well, these two passages are in conflict. Do you know that there was a whole set of people that said that James should not be in the Bible because it didn't go along with Romans? And I've heard people say, well, Paul, you know, didn't really have the correct understanding without James. I'm going to tell you the word of God is God's word. So both are correct. The problem with the understanding isn't in the Bible. The problem with the understanding is with 
muah. <laughs> it's right here. Most of the time when, when it's wrong, it's not because God got it wrong, it's because we got it wrong. Somebody wrote, I, I saw this recently, but somebody wrote and said something to this effect. You know, we don't need to rewrite the Bible, we need to reread the Bible, okay? We need to reread what the Bible says, but it says, but to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. That is hard for any religious person. It's hard for us because we go, this is what our mind goes to right here. We go, so you're telling me coming to church and everything that I do for God, all of that really doesn't count for anything. I want to tell you this. It does not count for anything in making you right before God. Because if that in any way could make you right before God, then why would Jesus ever come and die on the cross? Listen, it is apart from works. It is simply by believing God that it makes us right. Now, will it provoke a work? We'll get to that in a moment. Of course, I believe that works come as a result of our faith. But you have to get step one before you get to step two. And step one says this, apart from works, I am declared righteous before God. It's the old argument that says, look at the thief on the cross. Why in the world would that man see Jesus in paradise on that day? What works did he have? He had one work, one thing that he did. He believed God. He looked at Jesus on the cross and he said, that's the son of God that will take my sins away. And it was accounted unto him as righteousness without one work. He never fed the poor. He never paid a tithe. He never gave. He never served. He never attended church. But because of his act of, of, of faith, he was declared righteous. Now, that should not make you sad. That should make you really, really happy. Because the truth of it is, our best attempts at being religious and good fail. Can anybody say amen to that? It is only the prideful religious man that says, no, it's what I did that brings the blessings of God. Just as David, verse 6, also described the blessedness of the man to whom God imputed or imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those who law, whose lawless deeds are forgiven. How many here have lawless deeds? Thank God if they are forgiven. Blessed is the man, not who always does what's right, but blessed is the man whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. So who is the man that's blessed? Is the man that will not be punished for his sin. And folks, listen, why are we not punished for our sins? This is the part that I think that if it ever gets into the heart of the church, that it's by faith alone and the finished work of Jesus, if it ever gets back into the church and we really realize that apart, completely apart from what we do, we are made righteous because of what Jesus did, this is what will happen. If you believe that that's true, you will fall madly, madly in love with Jesus. If you know that and you believe that, and you go, listen, I was a total wreck and a mess up. And even on my best day, I can't stand before God. But thank God that he sent his son Jesus that bled and died for me. I had no hope, but Jesus paid it all. And if I can ever come to that place, the result of that has to be that I am madly in love with Jesus. Listen, the problem is not that the church in America or the church, that whatever church or church people there are, it's not that we don't give enough and go enough and do enough. My goodness, you can go, how many churches can you go to? How many people are going to church? How many people are giving to church? My goodness, we have TV stations. We have radio stations. If it was that that brought the blessings of God, America would be the most blessed country on the planet, and I'm here to say, I would like to tell you that, you know, probably you're blessed a lot more than others, but that we got a whole lot of problems. Anybody know we got a lot of problems? Listen, blessings and, and where the church will find its strength is when we cease from our labors and we go, listen, this is not about what I do or how I do it, but this is completely about what Jesus has done. And when I realize that and I walk in it, 
I am going to fall madly in love with Jesus. You see, the problem is there's a lot of people that come to church every week, but they're not madly in love with Jesus. And I, I want to stop and say this for a moment. I, I, this isn't in my notes, uh, I, but this is what I feel. I, I feel like the Holy Spirit is saying this. Listen, there's some of you that are here today, and you, you may have a lot of religion, and you may do a lot of good things, but I want to ask you this one simple question. How madly in love with Jesus are you? Is he your breath and your life and your hope? Not in a religious way, because when people start to talk this way, we always go, oh, do you give enough, do enough, go enough, uh, read enough, pray enough? No, it starts at this place that I believe what he did, and he did it for me, and I love him with all of my heart. That is the foundation stone of every person who lives a life that makes a difference in this world for the kingdom is because I just madly love Jesus. It is Righteousness does not come about by what good things we do, but David says, blessed is the man whom God does not impute his sin. That means that he doesn't punish you for your sins. How, what man is that? Is the man that has come and asked Jesus to be his savior and to wash away every stain. I want to say this. Actually, hold your finger there because we're going to go, we're going to keep on reading. But I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 11. Because when we talk about the blessings of Abraham, uh, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit tonight. But some people look at the blessings of Abraham and they go, wow, Abraham was a wealthy man. He was in the land of Ur, the Chaldeans. When he leaves, he has, I think it's 316 servants and donkeys loaded up and great wealth. He was a very wealthy man. And God calls them to leave Ur of the Chaldeans and to follow him. And now, but listen, here's the thing. If you look at the story of Abraham and you look and you go, well, the blessings of God is that Abraham would be wealthy, then it opens the door completely for the prosperity gospel that says, listen, God's plan for you is to be rich. Now, listen, I, I have no problem if God wants to make me rich. Is there anybody here that has any problem with God making you rich. <laughs> I have no problem. God, if you want to make me rich. And I believe that God blesses people financially. I certainly do not believe contrary to that. I believe that God blesses people financially. But I do not believe that for the New Testament Christian, that the blessing that he wants to give us is of a financial nature. I believe that this is what, this was the call for Abraham, was to stand as a testimony in the land and the day that he lived in. You see, he, was, he called him out of Ur of the Chaldeans, which is modern day Iraq. And he said, come and leave your people. I want you to come and I want you to be a father of a nation that is going to stand for my glory. And that was the call for Abraham. I want you to leave this place and I'm going to take you to a place that you don't know, that you've never seen. And I'm going to take you to a place and I am going to raise up a testimony for my name out of your descendants. You see, the blessing that God had on Abraham wasn't, I don't believe that it was all about finances. I believe that he wanted him to stand as a testimony on the face of the earth. And if, if I was saying to you tonight, what do I believe that God's blessing on your life, what does that look like? What does that mean? That you're going to be incredibly wealthy, uh, millionaire, big house, you know, private jet, and that's the blessings of God. If that were true, listen, the gospel works everywhere. How many know the gospel works everywhere? So that means if I go to North Korea to a pastor who's poor and he doesn't, he has very little, but he stands up for God and he winds up in jail and his house is taken away and his family goes through persecution. Do I look at that man and go, you know, if you just had enough faith, you would have the blessings of Abraham. That's silliness. If I go to Africa, to the, uh, some of the poorest people, we've been at places that are the, the poorest people on the planet, but are full of hearts on, uh, of faith. Do I look at that person and say, well, if you would just believe God, you would have a big mansion and you would be wealthy and all the blessings of God would be financial. I just don't believe that that is the life of the New Testament Christian. He blesses people. He certainly does. And he blesses us so that we can bless others and give to others. But if you reduce the blessings of God to how much money you have in your bank account, you are always going to be a sad person because it will never be enough. The blessings of God says, listen, the promise of God says that you will stand as a light and a testimony in this world.
And folks, listen, I don't think there's too many of you there that God has talked to you and said, listen, I want you to walk down to the swamps in the south of Florida, and I'm going to start a new nation with you, and there'll be alligators, but um, you know, probably none of us are going to go start a new nation. Amen? I don't believe so. The promises of God may not be like Abraham to go and start a new nation, but what are the promises of God for you? Do you know what the promises of God are for you? Are you here today and you go, hey, I don't even really know what the promises of God are for you. I'll tell you some of the promises is that you live an abundant life. That's a promise of God. The promise of God is that the enemy comes to rob and kill and destroy, but I believe that you'll live w with an abundance of joy and peace and the love of God. He's come to destroy the work of the enemy. I believe that, that God has come with the promises. If you're here and your marriage is going through difficulty, I believe that God knows how to restore marriage. You know, and listen, some of you have gone through divorces and it is of no fault of your own. God wants to change that other person's heart. And you may go, hey, I cried out to God and that person just left me high and dry and it just didn't work. God will never violate that person's free will. But I will tell you this, if that person gets their junk and they walk out the door and they leave you, I can tell you this, is that the presence of God will be with you and he will provide for you and he will stand with you. The blessings of God are real and they're for today and they're for you. I do want to ask you this though. What are the blessings of God? What has God called you to do? How has he called you to shine on the face of the earth? Because God made certain promises to Abraham, and they may be different promises to us, but there are promises. Every one of us has a promise from God, and what we need to do is find that promise, believe that promise, and inherit that promise. And so in Hebrews chapter 11, go, go with me down to uh, verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that, uh, where he would receive an inheritance. Was the inheritance just money? I don't believe so. I believe that the inheritance was the nation that would stand for the glory of God as a testimony. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. He had no idea where he was going, but he just began to walk. By faith, he dwelled in a land of promise in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, uh, the heirs with those of the same promise. And, and, and look at verse 10. But he waited for a city which has foundation, foundations whose builder and maker is God. Can I tell you today, that is the same promise that you have? Are you looking for a city today? Are you looking for a city whose buildings and foundations are not of this world? Because I'm here to tell you tonight, there is a kingdom whose, whose foundations are not about this world. If you live for this world and you long for this world and you want to be like this world, you will never find that kingdom and that foundation. But we are looking for a home whose foundation is not of this world. Man, we are, I think the scripture says we're aliens. Can I tell you a quick story? Uh, when I was uh, younger, I first saved, I was playing football up in East Tennessee and uh, I was, man, I had, I had more fire than I had since, uh, didn't have a whole lot of sense. And, but I, God really put on my heart to go into trailer parks and to witness to people about Jesus. So, I'm, you know, I get a day or an evening off and I just head off to the trailer parks. And I was so new as a Christian, but I would read the Bible and I read the King James. And the King James was really good. I love the King James. But it has some words in it that can be dangerous when you start to talk them out to other people. And so I remember knocking uh, at a door, and a guy comes, he's got his beer in his hand, he's like, yeah. And I go, I just want you to know that Jesus wants to make you a new creature. And he was like, <laughs> uh, no thank you, I'm fine being the creature that I am. You know, like, and I remember stopping and going, oh, I got to change that line. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but, but listen, the truth of it is, we don't belong to this world. And just turn on the news, CNN or Fox or whatever it is that you watch. And just turn on that, that television and look at the news. And can I just ask you, who wants to be, who wants to live for this world? There is another world. How did Abraham find it? He did it by faith. And you know, his whole life, he lived in tents. He left his nice house in Ur 
and he lived in tents and he slept under oak trees and his whole life was like a nomad. But he was looking for a home that wasn't about this world. And I'm here to ask you tonight, what are you looking for? If it's this world and living for this world, uh, you're always going to be at a place that you're miserable. But you have to say, no, my home is not in this world. It's in heaven. Go with me to verse 13 of Romans chapter 4. It says, for the promise that he would be the heir of the world. Isn't that great? That he would be the heir of the world. Was not Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. It was not law that would bring this to Abraham, but a righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, then faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. If you're right with God because you keep law, because you do acts of righteousness, it is no longer of faith. You either live by faith or you live by rules. But you can't live by faith and by rules. You live by faith in the Son of God and the finished work of Jesus. And he says, and it says now in verse 15, because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Go down with me to verse 19. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, uh, and deadness of uh, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but he was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Now you have to understand. God says you'll be the father of a nation. He looks at his wife. She's ninety years old, and he doesn't have a child. How do you know that'd be a little bit difficult? Anybody have a ninety-year-old wife? Okay, nobody. I don't think here tonight has a 90. Can you imagine your wife being 90? Where's Krista at? I can't even imagine. Are you, okay, L Lenny, are you trying to say you do have a w wife that's 90? Is that what you're trying to say up there? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> She's going to hurt you, and she can do it. Okay? But just imagine right now your wife being 90, and God saying, you know, you're going to have a child. That you'd be a little bit like, would you waver? And it says that he doesn't waver at that and being fully convinced that what he had promised he was also able, able to perform and therefore it was accounted to him as righteousness now it was not written for his sake alone uh, that it was imputed to him so it says that he was imputed as righteous because he believed God but now verse 24 but also for us it shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up our Lord Jesus our Lord from the dead who was delivered up because of our offenses and he was raised because of our justification. To those who believe that, you are accounted righteous, not because of law, because of faith, not because of how good we are, how good he is. Therefore, 5 and verse 1, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to see today, listen, so many people, don't have a peace with God. They always feel like they're in conflict with God. God wants you to come to a place that you're at peace with him. And that comes by faith. You don't have to turn there. But if you, if you were to go back to Genesis 15 later, the first time that God and Abraham have a conversation, there's times before that that God commands Abraham to do things and he does it. But the first place that they have a conversation is in Genesis 15. It's a relationship. It is out of relationship. And God says to him, just put it in a shortened way. He says, I'm going to make you a father of a great nation. And Abraham says back to God, God, are you kidding me? Can't, listen, before you talk to me about a nation and having this great uh, country, Israel, that's going to be my own, can I just say to you, I just want a son. Can you just start with a son? Forget about talking about the nation. Have you ever been at that place with God? And God is saying, here's the great promises, and you're going, God, can you just help me to pay the rent this month? God, can I just make it through this week? You know, I, listen, I think, you know, things are really bad with my husband or my wife, and things are very difficult. God, can you just get me through this, Lord? 
I, you're telling me about all these great promises of heaven and everything else. But God, I just need you today. And the Lord answers to him. He, sa he says this to him. He says, Abraham, come outside. Abraham goes outside. And he says, now I want you to look up and start counting all the stars in the sky. And he says, tell me if you can do it. And Abraham, of course he can't do it. And God says, listen, I put those stars up there. And I'm telling you, he speaks it. And he says, I'm telling you, I will make you the father of a great nation like the sands of the sea. And the scripture says that he believed what God said. And God counted that as righteousness. Now, this is, this is the good part. When that righteousness is, is given to him. And he says, and this is what happens at salvation. I want you to get this picture. Because God says to us, listen, I will make you completely pure in my sight. You have peace with me. There's no wall of partition. The veil that was there has been rent. It's been taken away. I, everything that's between you and I is dealt with. Every sin, all the shame, every difficulty, I've dealt with it. And we stand and we look at God sometimes and we go, God, really? Because I feel like such a failure. I feel like I'm so far from being where you want me to be. And God says, no, listen to me. I'm saying to you, you're right with me. You are my son, you are my daughter, and I love you, and I've dealt with your sin, and you are righteous before me. And then you stop in the midst of your shortcomings and your inabilities and your lack of faith. And you look at him and you say, no, God, listen, I believe what you say over what I think. If you say that I stand right before you, and that Jesus can pay it all and take all my sins away. If you say that, then I believe what you say. In that moment, this is what happens. When you do that for the first time, that's what's called being born again. And at that moment, God forgives you. And the Holy Spirit comes inside of you. And he makes you new. And you are completely right before him. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. All the sin, all of the shame is dealt with. And you go, but I don't feel like it. It does not matter what you feel like. What matters is what is true. And in that moment, it's true. Now, when that happens and God forgives you of your sin, this is what the scripture says. He imputes righteousness. That means that he makes you righteous. And you go, well, I don't want to be righteous. I don't know who would say that. But if you did say, well, I just really, you know, I just don't want to be righteous. I'm not good enough. Wh whatever. You don't have a choice. When you are forgiven of your sin, the scripture says, we just read it time after time in Romans, he imputes righteousness and he says, if you're born again and the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, there you now, righteousness is imputed upon you, tag your it, sins are forgiven, you stand righteous before God. Now listen, this does not mean that God doesn't see sin or he doesn't see unbelief, uh, there's silliness that goes out and in certain circles that acts like God's, you know, you just sinned and God didn't see it. I just committed adultery and God is somehow blind to that. That's foolishness, okay? Go, go through and read Revelation in the first few chapters there and it talks about the sins and God dealt with the sins. But listen, the, the penalty of your sin has been dealt with. So now what God does when you sin, is anybody here since they got saved sinned? Okay. You didn't raise your hand, you just sinned again. So there's another one. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> every one of us have sinned since we got saved. So does God go, oh, you lied. Oh, you stole $10 from Pastor Ryan, but I just didn't see it. No, he sees it. And, but what he does, sorry, Pastor. But what he does is he deals with you like a son or a daughter. And what, what happens if I saw Noah, which he would never do this. He's the rules guy. But he would never steal 10 But if he stole $10 from Pastor Ryan, after, uh, no, I, I, would, uh, I was about to exaggerate and say once he picked himself up off the floor, but I would not strike him, okay? That would have been an exaggeration. But after I was like, what do you mean you stole $10 from Pastor Ryan? What would I do? I would say, now listen, you march over there and you give that $10 back to Pastor Ryan. As a matter of fact, you take another $10 and you give it back to him so he can go buy lunch for the trouble. And you apologize to him face to face. And I would make it, how many of you would make that as hard as you could if your child took $10 from Pastor Ryan? Would you ignore it? Would you go, oh, well, you know, uh, Noah, you are just beautiful and righteous. And even though you stole $10 from Pastor Ryan, all I see is how good you are. Nobody would do that. We would whoop them. And after we whooped them, they would march right over and give the $10 back. 
And, but, but listen, that is discipline like a son. And there is a difference in the way that God, he doesn't condemn you. He doesn't say, okay, now you t- stole $10 from Pastor Ryan. You know what? You're going to hell forever. He doesn't do that. He loves you as a son. So what he does is he deals with you as a son because of disobedience. He doesn't not see it, but he, the penalty of it was taken by Jesus. And Jesus doesn't pay for your sin, and then you have to pay for your sin. It was paid once and for all, for all times. But he will discipline you like a father disciplines his son. Now, I just want to ask you, how many say that sounds right? You know why it sounds right? Because it is right. But you don't have to get on a treadmill. If, if Noah or one of my children or your child always felt like every time they came around you, they go, I always have to well, work to gain my father's love. I better, I better take the garbage out or he's not going to love me. That, is that healthy? But you know what? There are Christian people that they act that way for Jesus. They go, oh, I better pay my tithes or he's going to hate me. Oh, he's going to put a curse on me if I don't give money today. If I don't do this, oh my goodness, God's going to bring a curse on me. Stop talking that way. It's not true. Okay? It's not true. Do, do, should we give? We should give and we should give in faith because we love God. I believe it's scriptural. And I believe if you don't give, if you're a person and you go, I'm not giving to God. He is going to deal with you as a son, which means he's going to be like, hey, you know, this is a part of the life of a giving person, and you need to do that. But I don't think that he's going to put you under a curse and send you to hell because you don't give money. Come on. He will deal with you like a son because that's what you are. He loves you. You, are, you, are, you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit, and righteousness has been imputed upon you. If you ever get this, you'll start to look at God as your father who loves you, even when you mess up, he, he doesn't do this hyper grace thing where, oh, I don't see it, uh, God, you know, what, what do you mean you just, you know, committed adultery? I didn't see that at all. I, he knows. He just chooses not to impute our sins against us. He chooses to deal with us as sons and daughters that he loves, and he will do that in quite an ample way. How many of you know, has anybody ever done something that's wrong before God and you know that he was disciplining you? I think that it says this in Hebrews, that discipline is never a nice thing. It always doesn't feel good. Sometimes in your relationship with God, if you were missing it or messing up, that he'll kind of go, hey, you haven't had any personal time with me and I love you more than anything. But listen, when you start to run this life on your own and you go your own way, you're going to wind up in a mess. So, hey, I love you, but you need to stop putting everything else in front of me and you need to serve me with all of your heart and all of your life. How do you know that God will do that? He will do that. Not because he hates you, but because he loves you. Get this. Now, if you understand that, go with me to James. And we'll read James and hopefully it will make a bit of sense. And then we'll go home. In chapter 2 and verse 17, it says this now. James writes and he says, Thus also uh, faith by itself does not have Uh, that does not have works is dead but someone will say you have faith and I have works show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works you believe that there is one God and I want you to notice this never does it say that you are made right by your works what this says is this is that when you begin to live by faith there will be works that follow it does not say if you work then somehow you'll muster up faith along the way. It never says that. It says if you have faith, it will produce a life of works. The word pistis faith is an action word. So when you live by faith in Jesus, it doesn't mean that you get lazy on God and quit. It means that you step out in faith. Abraham, because he believed God, walked 1,500 miles. The, walking the 1,500 miles didn't make him righteous. He was declared righteous when he decided to follow God and believe him. But the 1,500 steps was steps of faith. So listen, in your spiritual life, you are declared righteous when you believe. But if that is true faith and God speaks to you, then you go, God, because I believe who you are and I trust you, now I'm going to take steps of faith. And it's not a work that makes you right before God, but it is something that after you have that imputed righteousness and faith comes alive in your heart, you'll go, yes, God, whatever you want, I'll obey you. That is 
that is works that is proper before God. Listen, how many know God wants us to do right things? But the reason that we do them and the way that we do them are important. The motivation of our heart is important. If you do it to gain his approval, he doesn't like that. But if you do it because he has approved of you, he loves that. If you get that, you'll understand the whole argument in that moment. In verse 19, you believe that there's one God, you do well. But even the demons believe and tremble. So it's just believing with your head doesn't do the trick. It's a belief with your heart. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified uh, by works when he offered Isaac uh, his son on the altar? Now, when you read that and you just take it out of context, you go, yeah, he was saved by works. Listen, the Bible never contradicts. What he's saying is because he believed what God said, he worked. He wasn't saved by his works, but his faith produced a heart of belief that would take his son Isaac and bring him to a place where he was willing to sacrifice him and give him to the Lord because he believed God. Did, do you not see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. He quotes the same passage. And he was called the friend of God there was, because there was a relationship. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Likewise, not, uh, was not uh, Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Now what he is not saying is that now you work enough and somehow it will produce faith. Or if you work, that will make you right before God. What he's saying, the way that you marry these two passages together is when you understand that in my faults and my failures, I come before God and he declares me righteous. He imputes me as righteous. But that is not so that I stop and die in my faith. And you see, there's some people that go, oh, 20 years ago I accepted the Lord. Now I'm on my uh, recliner and I'm clicking the TV day and night and, because I was saved by faith. That's, now listen, faith is an action word. So what happens is, is that when you believe God, he imputes righteousness, but God is going to move you to action. You're not saved by your action. You're not made right by your action. But God will begin to stir you for the lost, for the hurting, for the broken, to come to church. Why do we come to church? I don't come to church to get right before God. But listen, because I'm right with God, where is the very place I want to be? In church, worshiping God because I believe him, because I want to be with brothers and sisters and encourage them. Why? Not, but not out of a work to get right before God, but because of faith. I want to come into a place and come, come alive and see God touch other people and work in other people's life and encourage people. And if you think that the greatest ministry that will happen tonight is on this stage, I believe that you're wrong. I believe that the greatest ministry that will happen in this church tonight is right across these pews. Because listen, there's some people tonight that I won't have a chance to stop and encourage. But that person may be right next to you. And you encourage them. And you love them. And you minister to them. And you know what? When that begins to happen in the life of the church, we have what happens now. Where people come in and they go, my goodness, the church is so friendly. Not because I'm telling everybody to be friendly. But because Jesus gets into your heart and you love him. And there is an action of faith. When by faith now the works begin to happen because I see Jesus and I want to be like Jesus. And folks, listen, here, and I'll close on this. You say, what is the connecting factor? It's one thing, to fall madly in love with Jesus. Because listen, he paid it all. And by faith, when I believe in that finished work, listen, when I, you cannot help but have an absolute love and adoration for Jesus if you believe that you were dead without hope, you, no way you can make your right. There's not enough old ladies that you could help across the street. There's not enough good things you could do. There's not enough money you could give. The best things that you could do would fall incredibly short, and you realize that. You know it. Not one thing that I can do to be made right before God. So Jesus came, and he gave his life as a sin offering to take my sins away. If you really believe that, 
I dare you to believe that and not love Jesus with all of your heart. I think that the reason that there's so many casual cultural Christians that aren't just on fire for God, why? Because I don't think that they really believe it. Because if you really believe that, there will be a fire shut up in your bones and you won't be able to stop it. And when that fire gets into your heart, listen, works, it's not even works. It's a life of faith that takes steps that believe God. And tonight, this is my encouragement to you. Man, don't sit in the place that you're at and go through life and do hopeless things. There's somewhere along the line, if you would see Abraham living in a world, he's wealthy, got the big house, all the family, and God says, no, I want to take you and I want you to stand as a testimony and I want you to look for a, a, a place whose foundation is not in this world, but the foundations are in heaven. How do you want that tonight? Not a little bit, but how many of you are like, oh, I want that. I want that. I want everything that God has for me. I want it. You won't get it because you do enough. You'll do it because you believe enough. That's the person that inherits the promises. Bow your heads if you would for a moment. Worship team if you would. Father God, I pray in this place because, Lord, I sense this in my heart that there's people that may be here tonight and they just need to fall madly in love with you again. That, Lord, all the things that can unprioritize our life, we can get our eyes and our hearts set on so many different things. And, God, I pray tonight that there would be a voice that shakes from heaven, God, that speaks into people's lives. That, God, that we wouldn't live our lives for ourselves. But, God, at some point we would see the great work that you've done at the cross. Lord, and everything that you've done for us. And, God, our life, everything that we do and everywhere we go and everything that we say would be birthed out of a faith and a love and an adoration for you. God, not because we're trying to earn your love. You've already given that to us. But God, because we know how loved and adored we are in your presence. And now, Lord, we just want to walk with you. Jesus, I pray tonight, Lord, for anyone that may be here tonight. And you just need, Lord, just need to do a fresh work in their hearts. There, there's a plea in my heart tonight, church. That you keep, with your heads bowed, I, there's a plea in my heart. Because I think some of you maybe have been through church, maybe some of you all your life, you've been in church and you've done the church thing. God wants it to be more than a church thing. He wants it to be madly falling in love with Jesus again to where he is your everything and you love him. Not works, not plastic religion. I'm, that's the last thing that I'm talking about tonight. But I'm talking about something that's real, that loves God and wants to walk with him tonight. He wants to do a fresh work in some hearts tonight. You just have to be a willing participant. Abraham believed what God said and God accounted it to him as righteousness. It was hard for him to believe but when he believed it God broke through on his behalf. Jesus I pray tonight that you would break through in some people's behalf tonight. With every head bowed and every eye closed if you're here tonight and you would just, in the honesty in your heart, just say, Pastor, I just I want that love and adoration for Jesus in a fresh way. I want him to bring a fresh work into my life. I know that I need it. This isn't law. This is just somebody that has a cry or a plea in their heart that just wants to madly be in love with Jesus. And tonight you go, I just, I don't know if I'm there, but I know that I can be there. If that's you, will you just raise your hand? I want to pray with you. Yes. Yes, yes. Praise God. Who else tonight? We just say, just do a fresh work in my heart. Thank you, Jesus. You know, on Wednesday nights, one of the things that we're trying to do in our hearts, we want to, we want to, we want to challenge you in your faith, and we want this to be a place that we can just, you know, really go after God. And I'm just going to ask you this. I know you're sitting in your chairs, but if you could do this, we're going to sing one last song. But can we come and just gather around the altar? just linger for a moment. Maybe just find yourself at, a, at, at, at the steps. You can stand here. You can, but if you would, come. Come. If you would. Even, even if you want to sit, just come and sit on the front rows. Just if, if you can. Just, just draw near. Just draw near. Let it be the cry of your heart tonight that goes, Lord, 
want to madly fall in love with you. There's so many things that can get in the way. The trials of life can choke things out. It's, it's easy to get your priorities upside down. And relationships and work. And listen, there's so many things that are going on. But the promises of God says, I'll bring you through every one of them if you'll just trust me. Praise God. Lift your voices in worship and just ask Him, Jesus, I just want to love you in a fresh way tonight. God, don't leave me where I'm at. Lord, you've imputed righteousness. If you're a believer tonight, you've imputed righteousness. Lord, help me to believe this, Lord. Help me to believe and know that it's true. Strike something in me, God. Lord, move me, God, to steps of faith, not out of law, not out of legalism, but God, out of a heart that just loves you and desires to serve you. God, I pray, Lord, that you would move in the hearts of men and women. Jesus, thank you, Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. God, we thank you tonight, Lord, that in your justice and in your complete holiness, Lord, you derived a plan to accept sinful man. And Lord, I thank you, Lord, that if we had any part outside of just trusting and believing, Lord, you always knew that we would fail. And God, you devised a plan that we had to simply believe in the work that you would do. And Lord, it was through that that you imputed righteousness. Lord, when we look at it, the only, the only conclusion that we can come to, Lord, is that you love us with an incredible love that you would have to pay the whole price and leave it only for us to believe you and to trust you. And then, Lord, out of that life of faith, something so fresh and bold and alive would come. We thank you. Churches, you're just standing there. If you've ever been to a marriage conference or marriage counseling, you know, you can't make people love each other. I've sat down with people and I could, I could tell them to hug. I could tell them to tell each other 20 times that they love it. You, how do you make somebody love another person? And if you're here tonight and you go, you know, I really tried to love Christ. I want to love, I just don't know how, but I know that I should love him more than I do. Listen, we can't force you. I can't force you. God can't force you. But if I would just say to you, if you come to him, and out of, a, out of something in your heart that says, God, I know that I should love you in a greater way, and I see all that you've done, and I feel like that I'm not madly in love. Lord, how do I get there? The first step is just confessing and saying and being honest with where you are. And then the second step is followed by that and just saying, Jesus, you know how to put a spark in my heart again. I can't love you in myself. I can't find it in myself. But Jesus, if you put a spark in my heart in a fresh way tonight, Lord, you can spark a fresh and a new love. It cannot be forced. We're smart enough to know that. I can't call you down to an altar and go, well, they're, they're, they're in love with Jesus now. It doesn't happen. It happens when that spark comes into your heart and it's a spark you can't create. You just have to trust Him for it. So God, tonight, we come to you. Lord, some of us with our emptiness, some of us, Lord, we're here and we love you, but we know that we're not madly, that madly in love where you're the thing that we think about and love and adore more than anything in this life. We've somehow, we've lost that, and we don't know how to get that. So Lord, I just pray tonight in all of your power and all of your strength and all of your beauty and wonder, Lord, put a spark in our hearts again. Lord, to love you with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind. In Jesus, we believe you to do this tonight. In your mighty name. How many believe that Jesus can put a spark back in you again? Amen. Praise God. He can put that spark there. You just trust him. Praise God. There's no other name like the name of Jesus. Listen, our closing tonight is going to be this. I told you this earlier. The greatest ministry that will happen tonight won't be on the stage. I want you to find somebody, encourage somebody, love somebody, minister to somebody. And listen, go home and get in your little prayer closet 
because God will move in that little prayer closet and just say, Lord, you bring that spark into my heart again, that fresh love. I can't create it. I can't make it be there. I, I wish I could, but I can't. Lord, put that spark in my heart again. And Lord, I love you. And then when you get that, don't let it go <laughs> for anything in this life. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Let's just give Lord praise tonight. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. We love you tonight. Praise God.